watching um, the webinar today. I'm just going to give it another 30 seconds or so, as I can see um, kind of people uh, joining the webinar. Um, so I'll just give it another 30 seconds and then we will start. Okay, um, I'm going to get started. So thank you everybody for joining. Um, this is a RAPS webinar today on called Going Around in Circles, and this is aimed to be a bit of an introduction um, to circularity for fashion and textile businesses. So we've got a really simple setup today. So this is going to be a webinar format. So your microphones and video cameras should all be kind of turned off automatically um, and you can ask questions and make comments um, through the chat function um, and we'll do our best to try and make some time to answer some questions at the end. Um, we kind of expect this session to run for about 50 minutes to an hour um, and just to let you know we're recording this session and it's going to be available um, on our website after the event. Um, so just some quick introductions um, on the webinar today is myself. So I'm Kat Salvage. I'm the sector specialist um, for textiles at RAP. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Lizzie Ramsden, who is our business account manager on textiles. So just to quickly go over what we kind of plan to cover today. Um, so we really want to give some kind of overview on what circularity means for fashion and textile businesses. Um, why circularity is so important for the industry to meet um, net zero by 2050. Um, then the main kind of chunk of the webinar should be on kind of actions um, that you can take to embed circularity into your business and also touching on kind of the importance of collaboration for the industry to move towards circularity. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Lizzie now um, to uh, kick off the webinar. Great, thanks Kat. So um, before we dive into circularity and what that might mean for the fashion and textiles industry, um, I'm going to just do a bit of scene setting. So why is the textile industry so important and what are the main challenges that we're facing? So the fashion industry is worth uh, £32 billion to the UK economy and employs nearly 900,000 people. And in 2018, RAP's textile market situation report showed that UK households spend around £60.5 billion a year on clothing, which equates to around 5% of their overall spending. And we're also buying more clothes per person in the UK than in any other country in Europe. So the industry has a really key part to play in the UK economy, but it also faces challenges relating to its environmental impacts. So in the UK, the clothing industry is the eighth largest sector in terms of household spending. And this equates to over 1.6 million tonnes of textiles being consumed annually. However, despite it being ranked eighth in size, the textile industry is ranked fourth in terms of its environment, in terms of its impacts on the environment. So its impacts are very significant. And as the research by the Adam MacArthur Foundation on this slide shows, these problems are being caused because sales of clothing are increasing faster than GDP, but garments are being used less and disposed of more quickly, which essentially means that the carbon impacts of clothing are going in the wrong direction. The production of textiles is also extremely resource intensive. So as well as carbon emissions, we're putting stress on the, planet, on the planet's finite resources, contributing to water scarcity, biodiversity loss, deforestation, microplastic pollution and climate change. In the UK, the consumption of clothing and textiles accounts for 26.2 million tonnes of carbon equivalent emissions, 8 billion cubic metre water footprint annually, and 800,000 tonnes of supply chain waste globally, before the products have even reached the customer. Moving on to post-consumer waste, 920,000 tonnes of textile products are disposed of in, residual, in the residual waste stream in the UK annually with a further 620,000 tonnes of used textiles collected for reuse and recycling. And at the same time, RAP has estimated 
that a third of the contents of the UK's wardrobe are unworn. RAP has also estimated that only 3% of collected textiles get recycled into new products. And the EMF have estimated that only 1% of recycled textiles are turned back into textiles for the fashion industry. So you can see the impact of the increased consumption coupled with decreased utilization is causing a huge waste issue for the industry. So what is circularity and the circular economy? And how can it be used to help the industry continue to be a valuable sector to the UK economy whilst cutting the consumption of new products made from virgin finite resources and the environmental impacts associated with that? So a circular economy is an alternative to the traditional linear, econo linear economy, which focuses on making products, using them and disposing of them. In a circular economy, we keep resources in use for as long as possible, extract the maximum value from them whilst in use, then recover and regenerate products and materials at the end of their useful life. The circular economy can be broken down into three key principles. The first is eliminating waste and pollution. Then we've got keeping products and materials in use, and then finally regenerating nat natural systems. Following these principles will be key to the industry to achieve a more sustainable and resource efficient future, which exists within our planetary boundaries. But what does this all actually mean for fashion and textiles? So in a circular economy for textiles, products and the materials they're made from are kept in use and never become waste. So fashion and textile businesses need to think about how they can create products that are created from safe and renewable materials, made to be used for longer, and designed to be made again through activities such as remanufacture and recycling. So what would normally be thrown away gets turned into new products at the end of its useful life. From an economic point of view, the aim is to extract the maximum value from materials, components and products. By considering the waste hierarchy of reduce, reuse and recycle, we get the maximum value from materials and products that already exist. We need to use the circular economy to reduce and slow down the consumption of new textile products by designing them to be used for longer. We also need to prioritize reuse of textile products through circular business models, and then finally make sure those products can be recycled when they can no longer be reused, repaired, or remanufactured. And we'll talk about this in a bit more detail further on in the presentation. So the next question is how moving to a circular economy will help the fashion and textiles industry reduce its impacts on the environment. The textile industry needs to reduce its greenhouse gas footprint of the products it produces by 50% if the sector is to play its part in limiting global warming in line with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The industry and particularly signatories to RAP's Sustainable Clothing Action Plan, which concluded in 2020, have made great progress on switching to more sustainable and resource efficient fibres. Signatories of the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan collaboratively reduced the carbon footprint of products sold by 21.6% and the water footprint by 18.2% over the last eight years. Based on RAP's preliminary analysis shown on this slide, it shows that switching to preferred fibres will not be enough to hit that 50% absolute reduction that we need. Circularity actions, however, could make up over 50% of the reductions we need to hit those targets. So this really shows that circularity has important implications for the environment and why we must move towards a more circular industry if we are to meet the targets. As well as cutting down our impacts, it will also help the industry to become more regenerative and could actually help us to restore the environment. As well as cutting down the industry's environmental footprint, there are many other reasons that businesses, businesses should take action and start building circularity into their strategies. So firstly, consumers are increasingly demanding action and their engagement in sustainability has seen a rise since the COVID-19 pandemic. RAP's latest consumer research was conducted in October 2020 and found that more than half of people now view the environmental impact of clothing as severe. And this has risen by a third since 2017. So customers are definitely making that connection between their clothing purchases and the environment. This is supported by other industry research further afield, with McKinsey and Company reporting that over 60% of European consumers 
consider a brand's promotion of sustainability and their fiber use as important purchasing factors. Whilst in the US, 75% view sustainability as important, with over one third of consumers reporting to have switched from their preferred brand to a sustainable alternative. The UK government is also taking action and has signaled a need for change, having committed to achieving net zero by 2050, and with the Environmental Audit Committee reopening its 2018 Fixing Fashion Inquiry, which RAP has been involved with. So the sector can expect to see increased regulations over the next few years to help the government achieve this target. Looking ahead at what changes are to come, the UK has announced their intention to mandate climate disclosures for large companies by 2025. And the Resource and Waste Strategy has announced a consultation for an extended producer responsibility scheme on textiles, where producers take responsibility, financial or physical, for the treatment or disposal of the goods they have put on the market. The consultation will begin in 2022, with a scheme being launched in 2025. So this could mean we will see the upholding of the polluter pays principles, minimum requirements on eco design standards and eco labeling, and also policies to support the creation of infrastructure and innovation in the recycling sector. Finally, we are also seeing that investors care with environmental, social and governance related investing experiencing a huge rise. BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager and their CEO has said they will be looking for businesses to make the required progress on sustainability reporting, which has really set their expectation in this area. We also know from research that circular economy business models tend to outperform those that take, make and dispose. And with circularity moving from the fringes to center stage, the onus is on business to act now to remain competitive and profitable. There is also a real opportunity to use the circular economy and circular business models to help the UK textile industry build back greener by investing in green jobs that support circular business models and the textile recycling sector. So moving on to how fashion and textile businesses can build circularity into their business models and what support is out there to help them on their journey. In April this year, RAP launched Textiles 2030, which is our 10 year voluntary agreement, bringing together textile industry leaders to make rapid science-based progress on climate action and deliver a UK wide roadmap for circularity. Textiles 2030 builds on the successes and the learnings of RAP's sustainable clothing action plan and will support the sector to change from that linear model of make, use and dispose to a circular one, where goods are produced sustainably, used longer, reused by others, and recycled into new products. Textiles 2030 has two overarching science-based targets. The first is to reduce the aggregate greenhouse gas footprint of new products by 50%, sufficient to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius in line with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The second is to reduce the aggregate water footprint of new products sold by 30%. And a third target will be added around circularity, aiming to reduce the amount of virgin textile materials used to meet consumer needs. However, this is currently still being modelled. By setting these targets, we can help the industry to align their goals and tackle issues collaboratively. And as we have seen from previous slides, we can't achieve these targets without businesses implementing circular design principles using recycled materials and introducing business models that extend the life of products. Hitting these targets is a very big task and we recognize that no business can do it alone. To allow this change to happen, we will need cross-sector collaboration. And this is why Textiles 2030 is in a really unique position. So in terms of who's involved in the agreement, Textiles 2030 brings together brands and retailers, knowledge partners such as universities, trade associations. We also have the reuse and recycling sector involved, such as charities, um, collectors, sorters, reuse and rental platforms. And finally, the government also have an oversight of what's going on. So we're 50% funded by DEFRA, meaning that Textiles 2030 is the only UK government funded agreement of its kind. So we work very closely with the UK government to help advise them on policy. And as a result, our signatories are in a unique position to get involved in conversations on legislations, 
such as extended producer responsibility for textiles and introduce requirements for product design, labeling and consumer information. Textiles 2030 also aims to support the industry to achieve the targets through our Textiles 2030 circularity roadmap, which we have developed with industry stakeholders as a 10 year pathway, setting out key actions and outcomes required for the industry to move towards a circular economy. This document can be found on our website. So if anybody would like to take a closer look at it um, after the webinar in your own time, then um, please do head to our website to check this out. The roadmap uh, breaks circularity down into three key areas to make circularity and achieving those targets more manageable for businesses. Each area focuses on a different aspect of circularity. So we have design for circularity, increasing circular business models and closing the loop at the end of life. Within these three areas, we will work with our Textile 2030 signatories to collaborate and deliver group targets at a national level. For our Design for Circularity work stream, we want to bring businesses together to look at how the industry can design for longevity and recyclability, and how we can get the industry to develop consistent good practice design principles. We will also be looking at how businesses can design our waste from the production process. Our Circular Business Models work stream will aim to increase the adoptions of business models that use a product for longer, and finally, our closing the loop on materials work stream will aim to explore how we reuse materials after their useful life and how we can accelerate the commercialization of fiber to fiber recycling in the UK. So this is a snapshot of our circularity roadmap. And as you can see, it sets out a 10 year trajectory for how the industry can deliver the textile 2030 targets by focusing on those three key areas of circularity. Each area will be delivered by an initial phase of evidence gathering and research. Moving on to creating the business case, to testing, trials and sharing findings. And then finally scaling up successful models to make the circular economy standard business practice across the industry. The industry has a big job ahead of it. And we really need the industry to come together and collaborate to influence the way products are designed, manufactured, used and disposed of. This roadmap is designed to keep businesses from across the fashion and textiles industry on track and aligned with each other so that everybody is on the same path. It will require our businesses to work together and build strong partnerships with the whole textiles value chain. We also hope that by breaking circularity down, businesses will be able to see where it is most appropriate for them to take action and focus their efforts. And finally, it will be really important that we bring customers on the journey with us, as they will play a key role if we want to achieve a circular system. So we will seek to share clear messages that influence behaviours around how we buy products, use and dispose of them. There is a real urgency for this change to happen fast. If we want to tackle climate change and meet the ambitious targets that Textiles 2030 set, and setting this roadmap for the industry, follow will help them accelerate the change that's needed. So I'm now going to pass you back over to Kat, who will be taking a deeper dive into some of the actions that organisations can take to start implementing circular principles into their business models. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, and yes, yeah, so as Lizzie said in the next section of this webinar, I want to kind of delve a bit deeper um, into the three key areas that Lizzie's introduced um, and try and give you kind of some tips and ideas on how your business can begin to embed circularity into your strategies and also highlight what activities Textiles 2030 is undertaking to kind of support businesses in these areas. Um, so to really embed circularity into your business model, we need to think about how we can minimise um, a product's impact at every stage of its life cycle. So this is going to require businesses and the industry to be innovative um, in the way that we're thinking, um, as well as in the way that we kind of use new technologies. So looking at this diagram, it just really is showing and highlighting how interconnected um, everything is. So starting with design, um, design is going to pay, play a really key part in creating products that fit into a circular economy. So we must design products that are durable, look good and function for longer. 
Um, but we must also kind of consider um, the end of a product's useful life at the design phase, making sure we design products that are recyclable through the infrastructure and the technologies that currently exist or will exist in the near future. And then looking at materials, um, we need to start making products from recycled content. So this will lower the impact of materials um, and also drive the demand for recycled fibres and investment into the recycling sector. And then going on to manufacture. So we really need to try to minimise the amount of waste that's created during production um, and recycle any of this waste kind of back into the production process. So whether this is through manufacturing or uh, remanufacturing or recycling. And then looking at retail, um, we need to start offering customers alternative to ownership um, and buying new products. So, for example, this could be through rental, subscription, lease models or sharing. And then going on to the use phase. So once the customer has bought the products, um, brands and retailers really need to use their influence over their customers' behaviours um, to provide them with care and repair information or services, which will help extend the lifetime of clothes. And then um, looking at donation and disposal. So again, retailers kind of have a real um, influence over their customers here. So um, they can kind of use that to inform and make it really easy for their customers to dispose of their clothing and textile products um, through the correct channels um, and provide readily available collection points and take back schemes. And then looking at reuse. So once those um, textiles have been collected or donated, um, businesses really need to look at how they can get more value um, from these existing products by introducing re-commerce models. Um, and this could be through working with a charity partner or commercial partners. And then finally on to recycling. Um, so we really need to ensure that more textiles, more collected textiles, um, so that kind of uh, low grade, unusable um, textiles, we need to really make sure that they're recycled um, at the end of their usable life um, back into new raw materials for the textile industry. So product development teams really need to keep this in mind right at the beginning of the circle um, and at the design stage so we can see how it all kind of links back. Um, and then by breaking kind of this down into the three key areas of designing for circularity, circular business models and closing the loop on materials, businesses can begin to take some kind of meaningful and impactful actions towards circularity. Um, and hopefully as we go through this webinar, it will kind of demystify some of the actions that you could be taking. So looking at the first key area, design for circularity um, and what businesses can consider here. So we know that 80% of a product's impact is determined at the design phase. Um, and these impacts aren't just associated with materials and manufacturing. Um, they're also associated with um, the decisions that are made that impact how that product is going to be used, how long it's going to be used for um, and how it's going to be disposed of at the end of its useful life. So all this means that designers and product development teams have quite a lot of responsibility on their shoulders when it comes to a product's environmental impact. Um, but they've also got the power to make a real difference by rethinking the design process um, so that we're considering an entire product life cycle when we design. So yeah, it's going to play a really pivotal role um, in moving away from that linear model to a circular one. Um, and as part of the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan, uh, RAP created um, some circular design guides, um, which were exclusive for our signatories to kind of help them to begin to train their in-house teams on the basics of circular design. Um, and throughout Textiles 2030, we'll continue to work with signatories to create more detailed guidance and training materials around designing for circularity, um, focusing on how we can extend the usable life of textile products, then allow those products to be recycled at end of life, also looking at how we design waste out of the system and finally looking at how we increase the demand for recycled fibres. So we also need to make sure that we're taking into account any potential trade-offs that may occur when using um, different circular design principles um, and how we can help brands and retailers to kind of mitigate these trade-offs as much as possible. So for instance, by using a recycled fibre, 
it could actually make a garment less durable. So we really need to kind of look at all these different principles and how they work together to create kind of the lowest impact products. So just um, looking more closely at designing for durability. So this is looking at how we can create long lasting products which allow them to be used for longer by their original user and then passed on and reused through reuse business models. So currently the average lifetime of a garment in the UK is 3.3 years. Um, and our research has shown that by extending the active life of 50% of UK clothing by nine months, we could reduce the carbon water and waste impacts by up to 10%. So this is really one of the most kind of significant actions that we can take. Um, so making garments and textile products uh, that last longer will help us save resources by displacing the need for primary production of new garments and textile products. And we can really look at durability in two different ways. So we can look at physical durability, where we consider the garment design and construction in order to create products that can resist damage and wear and tear. And then we can also look at the emotional durability which takes into account the kind of relevance, desirability, and the emotional attachment that um, customers have to those products. Um, and this could also include looking at how we make garments and products more versatile, so it can be used or worn kind of in different ways and for different occasions, or potentially um, you know, looking at unisex garments that could be shared. Um, and RAP has developed the Clothing Longevity Protocol, which is available on our website. Um, to all businesses um, to really help organizations increase the physical durability of their products. Um, so it provides learning techniques to increase clothing lifetime and provides a structure for best practice within your organization. Um, and it also gives practical guidance um, to help teams think about how they can increase durability through their fabric choices. So for example, how can you use fabrics that avoid pilling or have a high color fastness? Um, and also looking at construction techniques. So for example, um, are there particular areas of a garment that fail early and need reinforcements? Um, and it also includes workable regimes for garment testing and how this can be built into the product development process, as well as highlighting the clear business benefits um, of durability, such as fewer returns and customer loyalty, um, as well as highlighting the environmental benefits. And you can also find um, case studies on our website of how uh, RAP has worked with um, brands to put some of these techniques into place. So with durability, there's also no official baseline or standard for durability as a whole. So through Textiles 2030, um, we're going to be working with businesses to kind of continue to update um, the protocol um, and create consistency across the industry. Um, and there are a few other strategies you can also think about when kind of trying to design durability into your products. Um, so one of those is kind of designing for repair. Um, and this is a concept of designing a product so that the major components can be replaced or repaired or updated if they're faulty or have kind of failed earlier than the main product. And then finally, another um, thing to look at is kind of the care information that you're providing to your customers. So um, Brands can look, um, can also use the kind of their influential status with their customers to provide kind of comprehensive care information to ensure clothing isn't damaged um, during the laundry process. So we've just included a few examples here of brands who are building durability into their business models. Um, so Tom Crindland is uh, known for his 30 year uh, sweatshirt. So this is a staple unisex piece made from loop back poly cotton, um, which is ring spun to prevent pilling. It's got reinforced seams and an anti-shrinkage treatment. Um, and the brand also has a clothing maintenance program, which allows customers to send garments back if they're damaged um, to be brought back to a good as new state. And then mud jeans, um, is, you know, is known for making jeans um, to last and offering circular solutions um, to extend the life of their jeans. So the company looks to promote the concept of emotional durability by giving um, customers the options to lease or buy. Um, and it also provides information on how to take care of their jeans. And at the end of the product life, it, will also, um, it also has a service where customers can send um, their jeans back so that they can be recycled into new denim. And finally, Ascot has developed a range of 35 pound t-shirts that are made from long and extra long comb cotton. So they're 20 to 30% heavier 
than a market equivalent. Um, and so that just makes the t-shirts much more durable. Um, they also have just three garment care guides on their site. So general garment care, stain care and repair care, which enables their customers to fix everything from small holes to coffee stains. So then moving into um, things to think about when designing for recyclability. So these are design strategies that kind of allow products to be recycled and made back into new products. Um, so when clothes come to the end of their useful life, this is when where the industry's biggest waste footprint occurs, with only 1% of clothing being recycled back into materials to be used in new clothing. So to tackle the waste issue, we really need to be thinking about the end of a garment's life when we're designing it. And designing for recyclability um, is also dictated by kind of the technologies that are available um, to recycle textiles. So this is a rapidly developing sector with some very established technologies such as mechanical recycling um, and others that are developing more rapidly such as chemical recycling. Um, and I'll touch a bit more on these later. Um, so it's really important that we start designing products to be recyclable now so that when they reach the end of their usable life, they're gonna be ready for these technologies. So what are some of the key questions that need to be asked when designing a product to be recyclable? So firstly, um, currently monomateriality is key for recycling of textiles. So this means avoiding materials that are made of blended fibres um, as they're currently very hard to separate um, for textile to textile recycling processes. Um, there is some kind of emerging textiles that can recycle polycotton blends, but currently the best way um, to design for recyclability um, is really to stick to one fibre. Um, so when uh, product development teams are looking at using blended materials, they really need to ask kind of if they need to use that blended material or if there is potentially a mono material option that they could be using instead. Um, and then secondly, it's really important to minimise the use of different um, fabrics and materials and components within a garment. Um, so again, using these different materials with different fibre compositions um, can really hinder recyclability. But if this can't be avoided, then we need to go on to think about how um, we can design a product um, to be disassembled before it's recycled. So, you know, thinking about if those fabrics can be identified and taken apart easily by recyclers. And then there are also lots of other considerations like how the use of trims, fastening, dyes and prints could affect the recyclability of the product. And then finally, brands, um, need to make sure recyclers can identify the materials um, the products are made from. So this could be through, you know, making sure that the fibre content is labelled properly on the garment or looking at uh, traceability technologies such as block blockchain. And again, there's a lot of innovation going on in this area um, and it's going to be really key to make sure that garments are actually uh, getting recycled at the end of life. And similarly to durability, there is no consistent industry standard to define what a recyclable textile product should be. So Textiles 2030 is in a really unique position here to bring the brands and retailers and manufacturers together with the recycling sector um, to develop kind of clear and consistent guidelines on recyclability that we can update as technologies develop. And again, we pulled a few case studies um, here of brands that are already working on designing products for recyclability. So apologies, I don't know if I'm going to say this brand's name properly, but Napa Idri um, have launched a fully recyclable jacket, um, which is also made from recycled nylon called Econol. So all of the trims, fastenings are made from Econol, which allows the whole garment to be recycled with no need for disassembly. And they also provide an online take back scheme so that the jacket can be returned from two years after the original purchase um, to make sure it reaches the right recycling technology. And Econol is also a fibre that can be recycled infinitively um, without degrading in quality. Um, and then quickly looking at um, ASOS. So as part of their circular collection, ASOS have worked on how they can create recyclable garments by using 
monomaterials um, that can be instantly recycled and where they've used more than one material, um, looking at how they could design those pieces to be disassembled easily before recycling. So they're currently taking the learnings from that first collection and hoping to build that into more products in their ranges in the future. And then finally, um, a startup project, Co-Make Shoes, is kind of an example of a brand that's taken on the responsibility to communicate to customers the kind of simplicity of its designs um, and the ease of disassembly for recycling. So the shoes are sent to the customers disassembled and accompanied by a booklet um, with background information about how those materials um, are used um, and how each one is renewable or recyclable. And by the customers having to assemble um, the parts themselves um, with kind of minimal sewing and no glue, it really helps customers understand um, how easy it is to replace any part of that, that shoe um, if it gets damaged or worn out. So then moving on to um, another design principle, so how businesses can look at strategies to design out waste from the system. So this really focuses on how we can minimize waste in the design and production process and reduce the amount of resources we need to create new products. So waste can um, occur in various forms. So textile waste, uh, wastewater, um, pollution and water pollution or microfibers um, are a few examples. But two key um, areas with really big environmental impacts um, are waste from the textile materials we use in new products um, and also processing waste, which is usually in the form of wastewater and water pollution. So when we look at material waste, um, it's estimated that between 15 and 35% of materials end up as waste during the pre-consumer phase due to the complex complexity um, of the processes along the value chain, uh, with the biggest losses coming from spinning waste at the yarn uh, production process and then cutting waste when the final garments are manufactured. Um, so raw materials make up the biggest percentage of a product's environmental footprint. So by letting up to 35% go to waste, um, we're not really using these resources efficiently or economically. And then we, when we look at processing waste, um, it's estimated that 20% of industrial water pollution globally is attributable to the dyeing and treatment of textiles. So these are some really high impact um, issues that we can address through design and working really closely with um, your supply base to understand where waste is occurring. So there's various strategies to look at uh, when thinking about designing out waste. Um, so firstly, looking at how we can maximise material resources. So looking at 3D design and fit technologies um, to cut down on physical sampling. Um, and this can also really help with reducing sampling costs and lead times. Um, and then also we could look into using zero waste pattern cutting um, techniques or 3D knitting technologies uh, to create kind of seamless garments with no waste. Um, and then secondly, um, working with your suppliers to map um, cutting waste and dead stock could mean that you could um, use this to upcycle or remanufacture the fabrics into new products. Um, so by understanding how much textile waste is occurring, um, it can also allow businesses to maybe um, start using kind of digital trading platforms such as Ambion to kind of link manufacturing waste up with potential uh, fibre to fibre recyclers or other um, businesses that would be interested in using that waste. Um, and also, yes, yeah, selling on kind of dead stock fabrics to, to other businesses that could use those fabrics. And then actually, as the kind of popularity of social media and gaming increases, some businesses could actually look at replacing some of their physical ranges with digital garments. And this is really particularly relevant as the British Fashion Council's Circular Fashion Ecosystem Report um, that came out um, a few weeks ago. It was just reported that 17% of young people wouldn't actually wear an outfit again if it had already appeared on Instagram. So then finally, looking at lower impact processes that brands could consider. So we could look at lower impact dyeing, um, printing and finishing pro processes to significantly reduce waste water. So for instance, looking at genealogia technologies for denim, um, such as ozone washing and laser finishing that kind of eliminate uh, the use of water and then at lower impact kind of printing and dyeing such as digital printing um, and spin dyeing. 
And then the final kind of circular design strategy I wanted to talk about um, today is kind of using recycled content. So using recycled fibres um, keeps resources in use for longer, which reduces the amount of waste created and the need for virgin materials, which reduces um, the environmental footprint of the products. So switching to recycled fibres could give one of the biggest environmental impact savings for new garments and other textile products. So recycled fibres can come in two different sources. So they can come from pre-consumer waste. Um, so these are the textile uh, leftovers that occur before the product reaches the customer, as we've just um, discussed in the designing out, out waste section. Um, and then there's also post-consumer waste. So this comes from products that have already been used um, and disposed of by um, customers. So this can be textile products or products from other industries, such as plastic bottles. Um, and to create a circular economy for textiles, um, we would really encourage trying to source recycled materials from post-consumer textile waste rather than from plastic bottles. And there's also different ways to recycle fibres um, or to source recycled fibres. So um, there is a mechanical recycling process. So this involves textiles being reprocessed without changing its basic structure through kind of shredding, melting, and then extruding fibres. Um, but this quite often can down, downgrade the quality of fibres and make them weaker and less durable. So they'd normally use, need to be blended with some virgin fibre content. Although there are technologies developing um, in this area that, that can create um, higher quality yarns. And then looking at chemical recycling. So this uses uh, chemical processes to take textiles uh, back to monomers, which are then used to create new fibres that can be the same quality as virgin materials. So chemical recycling technologies are currently not as commercial as mechanical. But again, this is a really fast developing area. Um, and by brands committing to using these recycled fibres, um, it's really going to help these technologies get the investment um, they need to scale up. And then it's also really important when using recycled content um, to make sure that those fibres are certified through um, a certification scheme um, and have a traceable chain of custody. So key standards to look out for are the Global Recycled Standard, Cycle Content Claim Standard and the SCS Recycled Content Certification. Um, and currently the most commonly and widely available recycled fibres are kind of recycled cotton, recycled polyester, recycled nylons, um, some cellulose based fibres such as refriba by lensing, recycled walls and uh, recycled leathers. Um, and these are all really key fibre categories for brands and retailers. So we kind of really need to look at how we can switch um, to these recycled options from the from virgin ones. And then very quickly, just a few examples of brands that are already using recycled content. So looking at Tea Mill, Ted Baker, um, and the popular Kankan backpack. And, and I think Tea Mill is a particularly good example um, to pull out here. Um, so it, it allows customers to design um, their own bespoke organic cotton t-shirts, um, which, which helps to kind of increase the emotional durability of those products. But then it also allows customers to send those T-shirts back to T-Mill um, when they come to the end of their life um, to re be recycled back into fibres to make new T-shirts. Um, so it's a really good example of a, of a circular system. And then moving into the second um, key focus area for Textiles 2030 roadmap, which is circular business models. So the most significant opportunity for reducing the environmental impact of clothing lies in increasing the active life of clothes by encouraging citizens to repair, reuse, upcycle and recycle their garments. So RAP estimated that a third of clothing in UK wardrobes has not been worn in the last 12 months and around 80% of people in at least some clothes that haven't been worn because they no longer fit or need altering. So these are clothes that are still in really good condition um, and are just being underutilised. And, and this amounts to around £30 billion uh, pounds of value sitting idle in, in wardrobes every year um, due to clothing underutilisation. So there's a really huge opportunity for brands, retailers and reuse organisations to profit from circular business models that reuse these garments. And on top of this, re-commerce is expected to grow five times over the next five years, 
uh, whilst traditional retail is expected to shrink. So brands can look at implementing um, circular models um, to encourage reuse of clothing to reduce carbon impacts by offsetting um, the need to buy new products made from virgin resources. And to be able to get the most value out of circular business models, uh, brands must um, initially make sure that these products have been designed to be durable. Um, so brands could look at increasing sale of pre-owned garments through resale or e-commerce platforms. Um, they could also look to extend the useful life of products through a rental service um, for appropriate product types. So maybe potentially occasion wear um, or lower frequency wear garments. Um, and they could also look at offering repair services. So Whistles um, has been offering a repair service which has diverted 40 items from landfill and given garments a new lease of life. Um, and our Textile 2030 Signatory Primark has also been trialling some repair workshops um, within their stores recently. So upcycling could be another option for businesses um, and some of our Textile 2030 retailers such as ASOS and Urban Outfitters have been able to report carbon savings um, through selling kind of vintage and upcycled ranges. And then businesses could also look at how they can encourage customers to swap and share um, with, again, another Textile 2030 signatory, Mint Velvet, holding swapping events for their customers in stores um, and looking at M&S and Oxfam's shopping collaboration. And then just touching on that collaboration um, a little bit more, um, that collaboration um, has collected over 35 million items of clothing um, since 2008 which has been estimated at 23 million uh, pounds um, worth for Oxfam. Um, and then again, a few more examples. So um, Asda has just launched a secondhand vintage uh, fashion range in collaboration with Pre-Love Vintage Warehouse in, in 50 stores after a successful trial um, in one of their Leeds stores. Um, so this kind of really proves that reused business models um, can, be a vibe, can be viable for all levels of the market from supermarkets right up to luxury brands. And then Eileen Fisher um, is always kind of at the forefront of sustainability and has centered its whole business around circularity. So um, their business model allows uh, garments to be returned to them, um, to put back into resale model. And if they can't be resold as they are, they mend um, and upcycle them or they recycle them back into new materials, um, which are used for future collections. So I think from these examples, um, it can be seen um, that RAP's support has been quite instrumental um, to some of our previous uh, sustainable clothing action plan signatories um, to help them take their first step into introducing circular business models. And we plan to continue um, to do this through Textiles 2030 uh, by working with businesses to create um, a uh, how-to guide for setting up these new models, so including research on customer demands, the environmental savings, financial viability, and case studies to provide practical considerations for businesses. Um, and we also kind of aim to show businesses that they don't have to create these models by themselves from scratch. There are currently lots of emerging startups and also more established businesses um, to partner with to deliver these models, such as Kind of Thrift Plus, who is a charity resale platform, um, Higher Street, so that's an online rental platform, Zoa, who are, are rental service providers, and Whirring, kind of an app that helps customers get the most out of the clothes they currently have in their wardrobes. So all these um, businesses have joined up to Textiles 2030 and are committed to helping the industry achieve our targets. And finally, looking at um, the third key focus area, so closing the loop on materials. Um, so this focuses on how businesses can play their part to ensure used textiles are collected and then making sure that the infrastructure is in place to get them um, to the reuse and recycling sector. So how can businesses play their part here? So with the raw material phase of a product's life cycle generating the biggest environmental impacts, um, and then the pre and post consumer textile waste related to UK consumption um, having a really huge um, footprint. Retailers can really play a key role here by just kind of committing to and demanding recycled fibres, um, as this is really going to drive investment into the reuse and recycling sector to build um, and scale up the infrastructure and innovation that's needed to support fibre to fibre recycling um, and create new opportunities for the UK economy. 
And another key action businesses can take um, is to set up a take back scheme um, to make sure um, as much clothing as possible is being diverted from the black bin and into the reuse and the recycling sector. So Wraps um, created a retailer take back guide, um, which again is available on our website, and that's to help kind of retailers, brands and their reuse and recycling partners to either set up from scratch or improve on um, a take back scheme. So this is something that we will continue to support um, businesses with through Textiles 2030. And just a few examples of some kind of successful um, take back schemes. So in the UK, Tesco's has launched um, a clothing take back trial in over 80 stores um, back in 2019. Um, and this has been successful and they're developing plans to roll this out further. So um, this take back initiative, you know, really makes it very easy for customers to dispose of their unwanted clothes, shoes and textiles responsibly. Um, and they can donate um, products from any brand and of any quality to the collection units that are kind of located in the Tesco stores. Um, so Tesco's is working in partnership with SOX UK who collect the donation and sort them into three categories. So rewear, reuse and recycle. So nothing is wasted or sent to landfill. And so UK also um, pays um, Tesco's per tonne of uh, items collected, which goes directly into Tesco's national charities. And similarly, um, H&M has a commercial partnership with ICO, which started back in 2013. Um, and this is a global take back initiative um, for the collecting, sorting and reuse and recycling of textiles and footwear. So in 2018, the H&M group collected a total of 20,650 tonnes of textiles for reuse and recycling. Um, and H&M also used the profits from this take back scheme to donate to their charity partners. And then finally, um, RAP worked quite closely with IKEA um, to pilot a textile take back service in their Cardiff store um, and that was in partnership with um, the YMCA. So the pilot um, was also supported by a campaign to kind of raise awareness and engagement and by partnering with the charity YMCA um, they would sort and process the used textiles before donating them to those in need in the community or to send them for resale in their shops to help fund um, their work supporting the homeless and other community projects. So the result of that three month pilot showed that running the service for 12 months at the Cardiff store could collect 4.4 tonnes of textiles and divert 1.1 tonnes from landfill. Um, and as well as helping um, to generate £6,500 in revenue um, from the resale of textiles for YMCA. So this pilot has now turned into a permanent offer in the, in the Cardiff store. And there's also been many more of our Textiles 2030 signatories that have set up take back schemes um, and particularly highlighting Donnell, which launched um, last month. Um, so that's kind of helping to raise awareness with customers of these kind of take back schemes in other areas other than fashion. So kind of moving into that home textile space. And then finally, it's going to be really important to bring customers on the journey with us um, to circularity. And um, they're going to play a really key part in the circular supply chain. Um, so this is where businesses are going to have to make sure that their comms and marketing teams are involved in their sustainability um, and circularity strategies. Um, so kind of key areas to focus on would be looking at how we um, inform and educate our customers on buying better. So this could be through promoting sustainable five choices um, or uh, such as recycled fibres or encouraging the purchase of secondhand clothing. Um, secondly, brands could look at how they can improve their customers' clothing care habits to extend the life of, of garments. And finally, brands can educate their customers on how to dispose their unwanted items in the correct way. Um, and we'll also be carrying out regular citizen insight studies um, throughout Textiles 2030 to kind of help signatories and businesses understand how to communicate sustainability and circularity messages to their customer without greenwashing. Um, so, you know, really creating some consistent and evidence-backed messages. Um, and as well as Textiles 2030, RAP also runs um, the Love Your Clothes campaign, which provides information tips and events to help people think about the way they purchase, use, and dispose of clothes. Um, and all the resources, um, all the Love Your Clothes resources um, can be used by businesses to help them communicate to their customers and are available on, on the Love Your Clothes website. 
And we've also just launched a pilot project in Leeds called Habits for Life, um, which is creating kind of repair, um, repair and uh, kind of uh, remanufacturing and upcycling workshops with citizens um, to help them create more sustainable habits and reduce the impact um, of their clothing on the environment. So um, hopefully the information uh, we've provided throughout uh, the webinar today has been uh, sort of helped you to start thinking about some actions you could take to start implementing circularity into your business. But I think it's kind of illustrated that it's a really, really big task with a lot to think about. Um, and we really need to work collaboratively uh, kind of within our organizations um, and not put the responsibility on just one team um, to kind of deliver this, but it also kind of really requires collaboration with your peers and the wider industry. Um, so at RAP, we believe collaboration is really key um, to driving change. And that this has kind of been shown in our previous work in the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan Initiative. So with circularity, the, the challenges are just too large and complex to be addressed by individual businesses alone. Um, and the interaction between businesses, governments and citizens can really accelerate um, that pace of change. Um, and collaboration is also going to allow businesses to ensure they're at the front line um, when we're setting targets and taking action and also being able to use kind of common insights um, and sharing them in a pre-competitive space to kind of develop those industry-wide priorities. And this can also lead to kind of collaboration um, which can lead to trials and pilot activity to really deepen our understanding um, and test the viability of, of which kind of circular strategies can be scaled up. And also having that wide participation and collaboration helps businesses that are at the beginning of their sustainability journey um, to really focus their attention on kind of what are the most beneficial changes they can make and learn from kind of brands that have maybe got more established sustainability strategies. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Lizzie now um, to kind of wrap up and just give a little bit more information on how you can kind of get in touch with us to find out more about our work on circularity um, and the Textiles 2030 initiative. Great, thank you, Kat. Um, so if you found today's guidance useful and would like to learn more, or if you are you know, just starting on your sustainability journey and are perhaps looking for an accessible way to measure the impacts of your business, and learn where to take those first steps towards sustainability and circularity, then please do speak uh, to the RAP team about becoming a signatory to Textiles 2030. We have a number of resources and tools that can support you. And as part of Textiles 2030, we've launched a, a members portal, which you can see a snapshot of on the screen. And this includes a, a full library um, of guidance for businesses, as well as being home to some of RAP's exclusive um, and unpublished resources uh, such as training guides and, and webinars as well. You would also um, get access to our footprint tool as a signatory, which is uh, an affordable and effective way to measure your carbon and water footprint. And it also lets you scenario model uh, potential improvement actions that you can take to reduce your business's impacts. And we will be following up uh, with a separate webinar on uh, this footprint tool uh, and how it can help your businesses uh, in, in the coming months. So um, yeah, hopefully today's session has outlined to you why it's so important to begin addressing circularity uh, and how you can sort of start to implement this into your textiles businesses. Um, but on top of, I think, you know, support and taking action, um, there's a whole host of other benefits to joining Textiles 2030, the full details of which um, you can find in our signature engagement packs on our website. Um, but just to quickly uh, run through a few, um, Firstly, I think, you know, by joining Textiles 2030, you can really sort of show industry leadership. So as circularity becomes bigger, both as a kind of brand imperative, but also through consumer and investment investor demand, being part of this agreement is a great way to, to illustrate your commitment to sustainability and circularity and really show leadership in your sector. Um, secondly, you know, Textiles 2030 is unique in that we are the only textile government funded agreement of, of its kind. So DEFRA and the devolved administrations are keen to work with sector experts to respond to the need for policy on extended producer responsibility in a way that can support businesses um, and Textile 2030 provides a structured channel for governments and stakeholders to discuss policy measures and prepare for any changes. Um, thirdly, you know, RAP can support you to positively engage and influence your consumers. So 
as Kat touched on earlier, citizens are, are a key stakeholder on this journey, and it's really important that they come with us. So RAP conducts citizen insights um, research, and we run citizen-facing campaigns such as Love Your Clothes um, to help us better understand customer attitudes and behaviours. And we support our signatures to share clear messages that can positively influence behaviour and to introduce changes that are most appropriate for their customer base as well. Um, Signatories are also uh, actively involved in and influence the reports that, um, and research that RAP conduct to ensure it provides kind of the most valuable insights for the industry. So signatories get early and sometimes um, exclusive access to those insights and reports uh, before the wider industry, um, which as I've just touched on is, is on that team's platform with the library of, of resources. And I think, you know, finally Textiles 2030 really gives people a seat at the table to make sure that you're having your voice heard and you're driving that change that is really necessary for the sector. So you can take part in cross industry discussions and um, share knowledge and set up pilots to trial ideas and develop solutions that can be scaled up for the rest of the industry to help deliver this UK wide roadmap for circularity. So as you can see, um, all of these signatories and supporters have already joined Textiles 2030, and we've got around 90 uh, in total at the moment. And all of these businesses have joined because they believe in the power of collaboration. And we will work together on design for circularity, to implement circular business models, and to close the loop on materials. And we welcome new businesses to come and to join us on this journey as, as well. So we hope that you've enjoyed today's webinar. Um, on the screen, you can say, see different ways for you to find out more information and to reach out to us. Uh, so please do get in touch if you'd like more details on Textiles 2030 and how it can help your business um, to achieve circularity. Uh, I think time-wise, we're, we're a little short on questions at the moment, but I've seen a few messages come through about um, the slides and the recordings. So there will be a recording of today's webinar and uh, the slides will also be available for everyone. And if anybody does have any questions, as we didn't have time to get to them um, yet, please email the Textiles2030 um, inbox um, and we'll get definitely get back to you. Um, so, yeah, I think it just uh, leaves us to say kind of thanks for joining today. And we really hope um, it was insightful. Um, and please get in touch if you want to know more. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.